Good morning, scholars. Welcome back to Asylum. How you guys doing? Uh, sorry for even later uploads. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, well, we have the kittens back. I mentioned that in the last video. And uh, they're back in the garage, and the door is completely shut now. I don't know that their mother is with them, however. Anyway, before I forget, Iggy is still in the tub, sleeping, presumably, and the turtles have been fed. I will feed Iggy when I'm done reading today. We are on chapter 4, page 30. Dang it. I feel like I was saying this. Anyway, Dan found them waiting at the bottom of the stairs. A phone call from his parents had almost made him late. But when he assured Paul and Sandy that he'd arrived just fine, and that his friends, Jordan and Abby, were waiting for him downstairs, his mother had let him go with a happy little troop. Hmm. Behind Jordan and Abby, uh, I almost said Andy. Abby reminds me of Andy from uh, Monster Blood. That was an interesting character. Most people liked her over Evan. It was weird. Well, not really weird, but anyway. A few lights flickered in the entrance hall. Jordan leaned against one of the tall white columns that supported the archway. He waved at Dan's approach, swinging a flashlight in his other hand. Abby had changed into a turquoise sweatshirt and pulled her hair up into a loose ponytail. Hey, she whispered, glancing around. We saw a hall monitor go by a few minutes ago, but nothing since. You ready? Dan nodded and joined them under the arch. Jordan tested the flashlight, shining a beam of light on uh, each of them in turn. Last chance to go back and do something sensible, Jordan offered. Like drink in my room and watch Thundercats. I liked... I liked the new series. It was good. Abby's nose wrinkled as she leveled a soft punch at his shoulder. You are not chickening out now. Besides, we can do that after. I'm going to hold you to that, Jordan murmured. Dang it! Today is a bad day. Following them into the dim, silent hall. Because I'll definitely need a drink after this. Dan knew what he meant. Now that he was here, he was so beyond nervous, it was like he was giddy. It wasn't a pleasant, pleasant feeling exactly, but it was markedly better than the kind of anxiety he was used to. I can relate. Softly, they crept across the empty hall, passing the notices and activities court board, the vending machines, and a rickety elevator that was out of service. Fewer lights shined overhead, the deeper into the hall they went, and when they reached the old office door, they found themselves in an almost uh, they found themselves in almost total darkness. Jordan lifted his flashlight from their feet to the door, and Dan's heart sank. It was clearly locked, and the sign Felix had mentioned turned out to be a poster board that said "Keep Out" in rather serious red letters. I thought this was an unfettered access situation, Jordan whispered. I swear, had Felix lied to him? What would the point even be in that? They must have figured out students were going in and locked it up. Darn it. I'm sorry for dragging you guys here. All right, all right, don't look so sad. From his pocket, Jordan produced a paperclip, which he proceeded to straighten. When he'd finished, he put one end into the padlock and started to wiggle it around gently. Just know that you owe me a lot more than Thundercats for this. Pretty impressive, Dan whispered. He had seen lockpicking on TV, but it didn't compare to the sneaky thrill of watching someone do it in real life. Jordan smiled, pausing for a moment. I can do it with a hairpin, too. Would you two keep it down? Abby looked over her shoulder. You're breathing harder than we're talking, Jordan. Bit down on his lower lip with an impatient sigh. The padlock shaking in his grasp. Maybe hurry it up just a little, Dan murmured. Dang it. I'm going as fast as I can. This is an art. You can't rush art. A light sheen of perspiration broke out, broke out over Jordan's forehead, soaking the ends of his bangs. Just almost. Dan heard the softest of clicks. Gotcha. Jordan pocketed the paper clip in his hoodie and looped the open padlock through the ring on the doorframe. He pushed the door. It didn't budge. 
Dang, it's stuck, he said. Give me a hand. Abby and Dan put their hands on the heavy door and pushed. The door felt like it was pushing back at first, but then it started to give. After one final push, the door shuttered open. How dare you? It burns. What was I saying? I don't even remember. After one final push, the door shuttered open. A cloud of dust swirled up and blew out to meet them like a relieved sigh, as if some pent-up force had, had finally been released. As quickly as the dust came, it dissipated, presumably less potent after Felix's trip inside. Ugh, that is foul. Hopping, Abby reeled back, covering her mouth to keep the dust out. It smells like my grandpa's house, Jordan said, his voice muffled through the fingers clamped over his mouth. They probably don't clean it here anymore. Uh, Dan squinted into the dark behind the door. Beside him, Jordan flicked his flashlight around, illuminating a wide reception type room. When do you think was the last time someone worked here? The Stone Age, maybe? Abby joked. She and Dan turned on their phone lights as all three of them moved into the darkened room. Their lights made little pools of blue and white, but were hardly bright enough to fight the darkness. That's an interesting image. They moved farther in. Slowly, details appeared. A low counter to the left where the secretary might have sat. A cushioned bench fixed to the wall on the right. Austere, I don't know. Overhead lights, long. Bear of working bulbs, there are no long bear of working bulbs. Across from them, along the far wall, was a slim door with a frosted glass window. This is crazy, Jordan whispered, huddling closer to them. It's like it's it's like it's all frozen in time, like they just got up and left one day. He passed Abby and Dan going to the counter and peering over it. Phones, typewriters, everything. It must have closed suddenly, Abby said. Together, she and Dan walked ahead of Jordan and approached the, the inner office door. The flashlight beam um, shined over Dan's shoulder, giving them all a better view of the letters that had flecked away on the girl's glass. W D N R A F D. The spaces here and there. What do you think? Dan leaned closer, studying the letters and trying to mentally fill in the blanks. Is this the warden's office? Most likely, having agreed. Think it's open? Only one way to find out. Holding his breath, Dan reached for the knob, noticing that it showed visible fingerprints in the dust that disappeared under his palm. Traces of Felix, probably, who must have gone farther in since Dan hadn't spotted any pictures so far. The door gave a quiet squeak. Squee, swinging inward on tight hinges. Whoa, he heard Abby breathe. My thoughts exactly, Dan whispered. Wiping his hands to get rid of the clinging dust, he went first, shoved the little by Jordan at his back. It was only fair, given this whole trip into the unknown was technically his idea. Okay, this is what it looks like. So, that's probably Warden. Uh, what do you think the last name is? I don't think it said anything on the back. Can you think of any names that start with an R, A, and have an F and D? Like it? Um, I'm going to say Field is the last bit of the name, but I have no idea what else. I mean, it could be Ford, I guess. I don't know. There's too much room between that. Oh well. They stepped into an office that might have been spacious if not for all the bookcases and filing cabinets skirting around, not to mention the piles and piles of loose papers. Dan tripped over a fallen lampstand, catching his balance by grabbing the edge of a large desk. On the desk, Dan noticed an old rotary telephone next to a stack of worn journals and notepads. I'm falling over. Sorry. 
I must be sweating a lot and not drinking enough water. Oh, well, that was weird. Then he realized what looked like an inbox of papers. It was actually a pile of faded photographs, less dusty than everything around it. I think I found the photos Felix was talking about, Dan said. Dan said. He shined his phone on the top one. A tall man in a long white coat with glasses Dan recognized. He squinted to make out the other details of the image. It was the same man from the photo in his desk drawer. He quickly flipped the next picture and let out a yelp. What is it? What's wrong? Abby said. Nothing, Dan replied. If he admitted the connection he just made in his head, he could no longer pretend that he was imagining it. Uh oh. Huh. The next photo in the stack showed a group of physicians standing around a gurney. Lying on the bed, oddly placid, was a young man in a hospital gown. One of the doctors was cradling his head in his hands, while another was buckling a heavy leather strap across his forehead. Nearby, a nurse was holding a syringe. Abby sidled next to him to stare at the picture, both of them trying to make sense of the image. It must be a treatment of some kind, Dan said finally. Dan? He must have been a patient here. Dun, dun, dun. He's so young, Abby said. He could be our age. He could be me. Dan shook the thought from his mind, peeling off the photo and aiming his cell phone at the next one. This is going to be a gruesome story. And I don't mean like gory. Um, there's this, There was one episode of Arlston. R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour? Is that what it is? Is that, is that the newest one that he had the shows of? Where the kids stayed in a decrepit asylum that had closed down many years before, and the ghosts are like trying to grab them and pull them into various rooms and dark hiding spaces. I won't spoil what the episode's about other than what I just said. Uh, give that episode a look. If I can find... If I can find it, like, on YouTube or something, or if I can just look up the title, I'll link it in the description. Hopefully I'll remember. Remind me. Um, and you guys can watch it. And maybe it'll turn out something like that, this story. Ugh. Ugh. Okay. I think I'm just going to read the one chapter in this today, since we're already at 13 minutes. Which is surprising, because I've only read six pages. Let's see. This picture showed a woman restrained by the table. Restrained? Fitted above her head was a helmet with wires coming out of it. A wooden bit was wedged between her teeth. Between the helmet and the bit, she looked like she was being tortured, like some kind of martyr. The photographs were horrible, but Dan couldn't stop flipping to the next one, and the next. Each picture showed a patient enduring some kind of treatment, from painful looking shots to solitary confinement. A photograph depicting the hydrotherapy depicting hydrotherapy, turned Dan's stomach. Orderlies were aiming hoses of water at a patient who was huddled and shivering in the corner of the room, completely naked. A doctor stood to the side, arms crossed, indifferent. Dan had read about this kind of outdated treatment before. He had a morbid fascination for the subject, really. Growing up in the foster system had given him an interest in social machines, systems that made decisions for people instead of with them. Not that he's comparing his life to the plight of these poor people. If anything, this system had made a good decision for him, all things considered. He wouldn't trade his family for anything. Wait, you guys, come take a look at this, Jordan said, and the catch in his voice caught their attention. He was standing at the far side of the desk, and flinch like pointed at the wall, where there were even more photographs hanging in frames. How awful, Dan said. Quiet, Abby spoke in barely a whisper. She moved closer to one of the pictures, gently wiping the dust off the glass frame with her sleeve. It was a photograph of a little girl, no older than nine or ten, with blank colored hair down to her shoulders. She was standing up, her hand resting on what looked like the armrest of a chair, like she was posing for a formal portrait. She had on a patterned dress and was wearing fine jewelry. 
but a ragged scar slashed across her forehead and there was something wrong with her eyes. She looked so sad, Abby said. Sad was one way to put it. Empty was another. Abby stood still, staring so deeply into the photograph that it looked like she was in a trance. Dad didn't have the heart to tell her that given the scar on the little girl's forehead and the emptiness in her eyes, it was likely that she'd been given a lobotomy. What kind of monsters would, would perform a lobotomy on a little girl? The picture hanging next to it shocked him from his thoughts. It showed a patient struggling, pinned by two orderlies in white aprons and restrained by a muzzle on his face. One of the orderlies uh, holding him looked positively evil. Dan was mesmerized by the photograph. Who had taken it? Or any of these pictures, for that matter. And who had hung them up on the wall? It's hard to remember they were here to get help, Jordan said. He was ill, Dan replied automatically. So, does that look humane to you? Those doctors wouldn't know the Hippocratic Oath if it need them in the groin. You have no idea what was going on, Dan shot back, then he stopped himself. Why did he feel the need to defend the very doctor, doctors who had probably performed a lobotomy on a child? If I have to be scarred, so do you. That was a poor choice of words. Who were getting ready to torture a man? When he looked down at his crossed arms, a bolt of fear shot through his body, and he wished to fill the awkward silence. I guess we're just lucky the field has come a long way since then. Why leave these here? Happy cried suddenly, gesturing at the photographs. Her chin was quivering. They're horrible. Well, at least it's honest, Jordan replied, putting an arm around her. Abby shrugged him off. I hate when people skirt around the truth. Unless we forget, this was locked. I don't care if they locked it up. She wouldn't stop looking at the photograph of the girl. Dan had an urge to grab Abby away before the hollow girl and the frame could reach out and pull her in. But of course that was ridiculous. She shouldn't be here. She should be put somewhere safe. Slowly, Abby raised both her hands and pulled the frame off its hook. A light patch showed on the wall where the picture had been. Abby hugged the photograph to her chest, her arms wrapping protectively around it. What are you doing? Dan said, unable to stop himself. I'm going to take her back to my room. She'll be safe there. You can't take it, Abby, said Dan, trying to keep the de desperation out of his voice. It's supposed to be down here. You need to leave it alone. Uh, Abby was about to say something else when Jordan spoke up. Hey, relax, both of you. It's not like you know her, Abs. You should put it back. Someone might notice it's missing. Who? she demanded with a little scoff. Someone, Jordan replied testily. I don't know. Maybe there's a catalog of all the stuff in here somewhere. Oh. Um. Abby didn't seem to hear what Jordan had said. She stood silently like a statue, gripping the picture to her chest. Please, Abby, leave her where she is. She belongs with the others, Dan insisted. Please. He couldn't believe he was arguing with one of the hottest girls he'd ever met. Just let her have it, Dan. You want her to like you. But the need to speak was more compelling. Abby's eyes seemed almost as vacant as those of the girl in the photograph. Then a shiver came over her, and she blinked. Gently, almost affectionately, she put the picture back on the wall. She touched it one last time and said, Poor little bird. I wonder if she ever escaped the cage. With the picture in place, Dan felt a sense of relief. He couldn't exactly say why. Come on, Abby said. Let's go back. I've had enough. That was all they needed. They scrambled out of the old office like it was a race, and Dan was only too glad to shut the door behind them. Hey, the lock, Jordan said just as they reached the vending machines. Don't worry, I already took care of it, Dan said, ready to be far, far away. You sure? Without waiting for an answer, Jordan turned back to double-check. 
the lock was still hanging on the door where he'd left it. Hmm. Huh. My bad, Ben said, laughing nervously. He really could have sworn he'd locked it, but then his memory had been known to play tricks on him. Okay. 20 minutes. Interesting. I wonder why that took so long. Well, the pictures are mortifying. Or not mortifying, that would... that. It's embarrassing, more like embarrassment. Those horrifying, that works. Oh, man. I wonder if it is going to be like that episode. That was a good show, by the way. I wonder if it's still on the air. I don't even know. We used to have the channel that it was on, but it's not there anymore. The Hub, I think it was. That and Beyond used to be on that one. I'll check Netflix, see if it's on there. What was I saying? Okay, let me know what you guys think. I'm starting to think this is going to be something supernatural. Actually, now that I think about it, I still haven't done that one video. Uh, it's probably going to be paranormal, now that I think about it. I wonder. Let me know what you guys think. Which you would, you know, which would you prefer? And if you feel there should be a distinction between them, or if you think that they should be the same thing. Anyway, until next time, goodbye everybody. I should get some Iggy food, and uh, I guess he should get out of the tub soon. Oh well.